Well, good morning to you. It's great to be here. I, I feel privileged. Uh, thank you, I think, Gil. And uh, thank you to Tony and to FRC for having me here today. What I want to do is talk with you about decision making in America. And so I'll be showing a number of different slides as I go through the presentation. You can follow along. Uh, it, the reason I want to talk with you about decision making is because that's really what has gotten us into the situation that we're in in America today. It's the nature of our decisions. Every day, you are making many, many choices. You're making decisions about all kinds of things. There are personal decisions, and the slides aren't working. So now I have to make a personal decision. What do I do? Well, I'll just talk you through it. We make all kinds of decisions. There are personal decisions about your health, about your family, about your career, about who you're going to vote for, if you're going to vote, and so on and so forth. But there are also many other decisions that are made for you that affect your life. Decisions by political officials, decisions by other people who affect the way that you're able to live. All of those things make a difference. And it's important for us to know that all of those things wind up putting us in situations that often we refer to as a crisis. If you read the news these days, what will you discover? You'll discover that we have a political crisis. We're said to have an economic crisis. We're told that we have an environmental crisis. We're told that there's a health care crisis, an educational crisis, an international security crisis. There's a digital security crisis. We have a leadership crisis. The list goes on and on and on. But the most important thing for you to know is that all of those are not the real crisis that we need to attend to. What America is struggling with the most is a worldview crisis. If I were to step back and analyze all those other crises that I've alluded to, and this is what I do, one of the things that uh, I have discovered is that that is really what we might consider to be a root crisis. It's the thing that drives all of these other difficulties that we have in America today. And uh, so I have uh, restarted it. Is it, is it working? <laughs> More proof that there is a God. <laughs> all right, so we do have a worldview crisis. That's what everything else stems from. All the political issues that we face, they're because of the worldview behind the political decisions we've made. The environmental crisis because of the worldview decisions that we made. The family crisis because of the worldview oriented decisions that we've made. And it goes on and on. Now, there's a difficulty related to talking about the worldview crisis in America. It is the root crisis. If we don't solve that crisis, trust me, we are not going to solve any of those other issues that I've alluded to. So we have to get there. But when you talk with people, about worldview. I don't know if you've ever done that. I, I teach at Arizona Christian University. I run the research center there, cultural research center. We talk about worldview all the time. It's a worldview development university. And so that's constantly in our conversations. And when we go off campus, we talk with people about it all the time. What's the reaction you get? It, it may look something like, uh, if we can show that slide, that would be great. The typical reaction you get when you bring up the issue of worldview is you get the eye roll, you get the deep sigh, you get the emergency phone call coming in even though the phone didn't ring. I mean, all of these things suddenly take place. Many people think it's an academic exercise. It isn't. Your worldview is one of the most fundamental development realities in the life of every human being. We'll talk about that process in just a moment. What we've got to understand is that everybody has a worldview. This isn't just for people who care about it, people who have thought about it, people who have been taught it. Everybody develops a worldview. 
Why is that? Because it's the intellectual, it's the moral and emotional and spiritual filter through which you see and experience and respond to the world. You can't get through any moment of any day without a worldview driving you forward in some way or fashion. See, you need your worldview to make sense of the world. Without that worldview acting as that filter and helping you to make choices, decisions about what to do in response to what you're experiencing, you would not survive. And so what we know is that your worldview is essentially the accumulation of all of your beliefs, particularly the, the key beliefs. And those are important beliefs because your beliefs determine your behavior. If we're talking about decisions winding up in action, it's your worldview, your beliefs that cause your behavior. Keep this in mind, you do what you believe. And so if what we're concerned about is how Americans are acting, how our nation is comporting itself on the world stage, the problem that precedes that action are the beliefs that led to that action. And the accumulation of those beliefs is your worldview. Think of it this way. If you have a computer that sits on your desk and it does not have a central processing unit embedded within the computer, what you've got is a box of wires and chips and other stuff that none of us know about. And as you tell that computer, you type in instructions of what you want it to do, it will just sit there on the desk. It won't give you anything. Why? Because without that central processing unit to make sense of the commands that you've given to the computer, it doesn't know what to do. Your worldview is your CPU. Every one of us has to have that to propel us forward. Now here's something most people don't know about for some reason. I've been writing about this for years. It probably just speaks to how little my writing has an impact. But here's, here's what we need to understand. We found from our research that a person's worldview begins to develop at 15 to 18 months of age and is almost fully developed, if not fully developed, by the age of 13. Every person's worldview is essentially in place by the time they become a teenager. Now, this is important because it, it ought to completely change the way that we think about children, about the way that we think about ministry, the way that we think about parenting, the way that we think about education, all of these things ought to be radically shifted by that insight. And keep in mind that my research has also shown that the typical American will die possessing essentially the same worldview they had at the age of 13. They might articulate it differently. They figure out how to apply it in situations a little bit differently. The situations change over the course of their life. Things become more complex, more sophisticated. They're confronted with more information. But essentially, they're operating with that same set of instructions in their CPU. That is to say, they're working with the same basic worldview that they had at the age of 13. Now understand, we've also found that there are three different phases of worldview in a typical person's life. You've got that developmental phase that takes place, as I've noted, between the ages of 15 to 18 months and 13 years. That's when you're trying to figure out who you want to be, how you want to live, what kind of a mark you're going to leave on the world. What is it that you're going to invest in the world around you? Between your teenage years and sometime in your mid to late 20s is a time of refinement. This is the second period. First period is developmental. Second period is one of refinement where you're taking what you've embraced as your worldview. And in your teens and 20s, you're trying to figure out how to articulate it, how to apply it, maybe refine it in some ways. And then the third phase, which begins typically in a person's late 20s, sometimes a little before that, until their 60s, maybe 70s, is a period of evangelism. Now don't get all excited because typically these people are not sharing Jesus Christ with a hurting and dying world. 
What they're doing is they're sharing their ideas about how other people ought to think and live. What they're doing is they're sharing their world view. Why is it that most people don't share Jesus Christ? He's not part of their world view. And what we do share is what we think to be true and to be significant, to be meaningful. Why? Because we want other people to believe the same way we do. If they do that, we feel better about ourselves. If we do that, there's more momentum behind the kinds of things that we believe. And so when we think about this whole worldview reality, keep in mind that every decision you make, every moment of every day flows from your worldview. It doesn't matter what the nature of that decision is. It might have to do with the goals that you set for your life. It might have to do with whether or not you even bother to set goals in your life. That's part of your worldview. It may have to do with your values. When we look at the shift that's taken place in the values in America, it's because of the shift in the worldview of Americans. When we look at the changes that are taking place in morality in America, it's not simply because there are more opportunities, there are new activities to engage in, it's because of the worldview that underlies the choices of how to behave as a moral or immoral person. Your worldview affects your choices about faith, about identity, about relationships, about lifestyle, and so much more. Keep in mind that every choice that you make relates back to your worldview. Now, how do you develop that worldview? That's a critical question for us to come to grips with. And we know that that worldview is shaped by many external influences. Uh, We've done a lot of research on that as well, which I'll share with you in a moment. But keep in mind that these different influences are consistently marketing alternative worldviews to us. No matter what you're being exposed to, it's pushing a worldview. And so as we did the research, what I discovered is that there are three different phases in our life where we're influenced by different entities in our culture. And what we found is with children, that period of time where the worldview is initially being developed, the most impactful entities that are trying to get us to embrace particular worldview elements are the media, public policy, and family. School is also embedded in that, so are peers. But what we discovered is that by far the most impactful entity is the media. A majority of the choices that we make in terms of our worldview and that then get demonstrated through our behavior come because of the influence of media. Now, there's all kinds of media. There's books, there's movies, television, music, video games, so on and so forth. But all of those things together, our research found, have more influence on the development of the worldview of children than anything else. We can look at teenagers, it varies just a little bit. Look at adults, again, it varies a little bit more. But by and large, those same entities continue to have the dominant influence on the life of most people and the worldview that they develop. And so when we look at all this, keep in mind that what's happening is we're faced with choices to make about worldview as well. That's a decision in and of itself. But what we tend to do, our research is finding, is that we don't buy lock, stock, and barrel into any one worldview. Very few Americans do. What most Americans do instead is they consider all the options that they're exposed to and they pick and choose the ones that they like. They pick and choose the ones that make them feel comfortable, the ones that will advance their best best personal interests, the ones that other people whom they admire have embraced, There are all kinds of reasons for why they'll embrace different elements of a worldview. But what we find is that for most people, virtually nine out of 10 Americans, their worldview cannot be adequately described as a single, known, well-defined worldview. It's a patchwork of many different elements from a variety of worldviews. And what's interesting about that is that we find that often the things that people have embedded in their worldview conflict with other elements in their worldview. It contradicts other things that they believe or do. Why is that? Because we are a superficial nation. 
we're more interested in doing than in thinking. And so consequently, we're always looking for the next thing that we need to be accomplishing, the next place we need to go, the next person we need to meet, without sitting down and reflecting on what really matters. What do I really believe? What difference will that make? What's it going to look like? And consequently, we take all of these disparate ideas and we weave them together into a, a personal, very customized blend that becomes our personal worldview. It's a cut and paste approach to developing a worldview. Now, I've interviewed tens and tens of thousands of people across the country regarding their worldview. At this point in my life, uh, I was telling Gil backstage beforehand, uh, a couple of years ago, I, I had to figure out what am I going to do with the last years of my life? I'm not going to have that many years left. I want to finish well. What's going to enable me to finish well? So I went back and reviewed the last, uh, I forget if it was 200 or 300 research studies I'd done, national studies, and, and kept taking notes about what were the important things I learned out of each study. At the end, I reviewed that, and the thing that I learned is that what makes the most difference is worldview. You want to make a difference in the world, you've got to deal with it through this worldview issue. And so in doing all of these interviews with people about worldview, one of the things that I've discovered is that nobody, at least nobody I've encountered anywhere in the country yet, has a pure worldview. Even people who have a dominant worldview that can be defined, regardless of what it is, postmodernism, nihilism, biblical worldview, secular humanism, take your pick. No matter what worldview a person has, it's not pure. It has elements from other worldviews embedded in it. And you see, when we look at all those different elements, uh, all those different worldviews, there's a lot that we're exposed to every day. Every television program you watch has a worldview underlying the messages that it's communicating to you. Every song that you listen to has a worldview underlying the messages it's communicating to you. Every book that you read, whether it's fiction or nonfiction, whether it's a picture book or a textbook, it has a worldview. I have three young grandchildren. I'm trying to help them develop a biblical worldview, and I'm shocked at the worldview in the books, the picture books that are developed for three-year-olds, five-year-olds, seven-year-olds, the textbooks that they're exposed to in Christian schools. When you look there and filter through it and say, what's the underlying worldview? You'll be amazed. But people choose from all these different worldviews because they don't think about it and they don't realize that there is right and wrong embedded in these kinds of choices. What we know is that what happens is that one of these options is a biblical worldview, sometimes referred to as biblical theism. Now, that's a way of understanding and experiencing and responding to your everyday reality through the lens of Scripture. And sometimes you may hear people talk about that, having such an understanding of God's Word that every choice you make is put through that filter. That's an important thing. Why? Because we're called to be disciples of Jesus. What does that mean? That we're supposed to think and act like Jesus. But you cannot think like Jesus unless you have a biblical worldview. And because we do what we believe, if you're not thinking like Jesus, you're not going to act like Jesus, and you're not going to be a disciple of Jesus. I'd suggest to you that in an ideal world, a biblical worldview would be dominant. But of course, we don't live in an ideal world. And in America today, the biblical worldview does not dominate. Now, recently we did some research uh, as part of Family Research Council. I'm working there at the Center for Biblical Worldview. And one of the things that we discovered is that 51% of American adults today believe they have a biblical worldview. My research, uh, Arizona Christian University, the Center for, or, or the Cultural Research Center, what we discovered is only 6% of American adults actually have a biblical worldview. What difference does that make? It makes a big difference. That gap is incredibly important because what it means is that most people who don't have a biblical worldview aren't even thinking about it. They don't believe they have a worldview problem. They're not going to try to solve a worldview problem in their life because they think they've already got it figured out. 
A lot of people are walking around America today self-deceived about their worldview, self-deceived about their status as an effective disciple for Jesus Christ. See, when we look at what's been going on in our culture, we find that the proportion of people who have a biblical worldview has been on the decline since I started studying this back in the mid-90s. I was working with Chuck Colson and a number of other people to try to measure these things, and we developed measures, and what we discovered is that, yeah, it wasn't in a good place back then, but it's only been getting worse over time. When we look at the details of who has a biblical worldview, yes, only 6% of adults have one, but it's pretty ugly within the Christian church across America as well. If we go to people who attend evangelical churches, four out of five of them do not have a biblical worldview. Part of that relates to the fact that evangelical churches in America do not teach the Bible as often or as deeply as used to be the case. When we look at born-again Christians in America, not those who claim to be born again, but whose beliefs classify them that way, that is, they believe that when they die, they will spend eternity with God only because they've confessed their sins and accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior. That particular group of people, less than 3 out of 10 adults in the country, with that less than 3 out of 10, only 19% have a biblical worldview. These are the people that are considered the backbone of the church, according to pastors, and yet most of them will not act like Jesus because they don't think like Jesus. We can look at what worldviews people are embracing. And I was suggesting to you that most people don't embrace any particular worldview. Here's the data related to that. We can look at the leading worldviews that are professed here in America today. And what you find is that none of them, other than the biblical worldview, are embraced by more than 2% of the population. Now, the biblical worldview embraced by only 6%. What are people buying into this idea of the cut-and-paste approach where they're picking and choosing items from Eastern mysticism, from moralistic therapeutic deism, from secular humanism, postmodernism, existentialism, and so on and so forth, and bolting them all together into this thing that we call syncretism? And that describes virtually 9 out of 10 Americans, 88%. So your eyes may be rolling at this point. You're saying, yeah, what's your point? So, what I want you to be thinking about is, does worldview really make a difference? It does. I've got the data. Let me share some of it. I mean, it, it radically affects people's truth views, and I've got a whole series of slides here. This is so critically important. It's going to be in the next book that I'm writing. You'll have it all in one place. But what we find is when we look at truth views, it has a dramatic effect. Whether or not you believe in absolute moral truth, by an 11 to 1 ratio, a person with a biblical worldview is more likely than other people to believe that there is such a thing as absolute moral truth. Whether or not the Bible should be a person's primary moral guide in life, by a 3 to 1 ratio, people with a biblical worldview more likely to buy into that idea. It, attract, it affects your views on morality, you know, what you believe about suicide, euthanasia. Uh, people with a biblical worldview don't believe that that's our choice, that God gave us life, God takes life. We don't do that. That's not in our hands. Most of America, or a lot of America, doesn't believe that. You know, whether or not it's okay to have sexual relations with people that you're not married to. Increasingly, Americans say, as long as it feels right to me in the moment, it's the right thing I should do. Why? Because another element of the driving worldview in America is that God's primary objective for you in life is to be happy. And so whatever you do that makes you happy is making God happy, and it's in, uh, in sync with what he designs for your life. That's the kind of worldview thinking that we're working with here in America. So you can see, you know, the right-hand column on all these slides, the ratio of those who have a biblical worldview to those who don't, huge differences. You know, we can look at uh, things like creationism. By a 25 to 1 margin, people with a biblical worldview are more likely than the rest of Americans to believe that God created us. You can look at, uh, you know, their perceptions about faith. What faith? Which faith? What difference does faith make? 
all radical differences. We can look at whether sin exists, whether sin impacts our life, whether uh, you know it's possible to even believe that God exists. Again, big differences based on worldview. We can look at other kinds of beliefs about the, the, the meaning of life, the purpose of human history, things like abortion. That's a big issue we're gonna be talking about here at this event throughout the next couple of days. And what we know is that the, you know, a, a large share of Americans believe that the Bible doesn't speak to abortion in any clear ways. That the Bible is ambiguous on this issue. You've got to make up your mind, uh, actually not even your mind. Most Americans would say you have to feel your way through that issue. You have to run with your feelings. You know, it affects political life in terms of how you make your decisions about who to vote for, where to stand on particular issues. You know, all of these things are affected. Your lifestyle, we could look at a lot of different behaviors because remember, you do what you believe. And so when we look at the behaviors, we know that the behaviors of people with a biblical worldview are radically different than those who don't have that worldview. What it comes down to is every choice that you, every choice that your spouse, every choice that your children, every choice that your neighbors, your boss, the person you put in Congress, the person who's your governor, every choice every person is making is based on worldview. So it doesn't matter what that choice may be, you can trace it back to what their worldview has led them to believe is right. And so I want to suggest to you that as you're thinking through all the issues that are going to be brought up here, go back to your worldview. Be thinking about what is your worldview? What does it lead you to believe? How did you come to these conclusions? Because worldview isn't just a game changer, it's the game. If we don't get worldview right, every kind of fix that we try to apply to politics, to economics, to family, to everything else is a temporary solution. It doesn't deal with the underlying issues that will cause us to make the right choices consistently. I'd suggest to you that, again, thinking that worldview develops when somebody is very young, it's critically important that we therefore be shaping the lives of our children. I'd ask you to think about your family. I'd ask you to think about your schools. I'd ask you to think about your church. And if your church is like most, it has a children's ministry, but the heartbeat of that ministry is with adults. We put most of our time, most of our energy, most of our resources into trying to do things with adults. With most adults, frankly, it's too late. You are who you are. We see very few adults whose worldview changes. It happens. God can do anything at any time with anybody, and he doesn't need my permission for it. It'll change the data, but I'll live with it. You know? <laughs> And so what we've got to understand is that, yes, investing in children is critical. I'm a grandparent. I'm spending a large share of my time trying to invest in my grandchildren, knowing that all of the media that they're going to be exposed to, most of it, is going to be antithetical to what I want them to believe and how I want them to live. And so I have to be an antidote. My uh, daughter, who's their parents, has to be an antidote. The school that we send them to, we talk with their teachers about what they're teaching. We look at the curriculum. We're involved in that. You've got to be involved in what's happening with children. And so that, that's critical. What we know is that today in America, only 7% of the parents of children under the age of 18 in America have a biblical worldview. That doesn't portend well for the future because you can't give what you don't have. And so the rest of us who do get it have to come alongside these children in some way. We've got to look for opportunities, sports teams, other kinds of activities that are taking place to help them shape things. You can't wait for your church to get the job done. I want to encourage you to recognize that churches in America are being shaped more by the culture than they are shaping the culture. We need to turn that around. But in that process, understand this is a battle for the mind, the heart, and the soul of America. And so it's up to you. It's up to me. Those of us who know God, love God, love Christ, read his word, study his word, embrace, embody his word, and to take that into the world in every way, shape, and form that we can. Ultimately, we will win or lose this battle long-term by what we do with children today. 
And so when you leave this conference, I'm asking you to think about making a list, identifying the children whose lives you can impact. It is our biblical responsibility to raise up children to know, love, and serve God with all their heart, mind, strength, and soul. And I pray that you will do that with all the energy and wisdom that you can muster. Thank you so much for listening, and God bless you.